like there's no tomorrow. Hey! Welcome everyone to the sixth lecture of the financial engineering course with a special focus on interest rates and XVA. Today we are going further into construction of our interest rate world and we will focus on building of a yield curve. Yield curve is one of the most important elements once we are talking about valuations, pricing of interest rate derivatives and I personally think that this is the most important element in general if, uh, if we are considering pricing of derivatives. It's used everywhere. It's used for discounting, it's used for pricing, it's used even in evaluations of companies when we have to discount future cash flows. So building and also understanding of a curve is very important, uh, not only in this course, but in general, whenever you are related in somehow in finance, yield curve is something that you will be continuously using. Therefore, I think this is one of the most important lectures of this course. And therefore, I also, uh, this lecture is longer than um, the usual lectures we have. Uh, it will have three books, each of them about 45 up to 60 minutes. So uh, I dedicated quite some time and I now uh, explain you what are the individual blocks covered in today's lecture. So um, we start with the yield curve and its dynamics. So this will be very, a little bit of economical explanation. What is yield curve? How to interpret different shapes of yield curves and how this is related to different economical status of our economy. Then we will go to the mathematical formulation. So if we are thinking of a building of a curve, first we need to formulate it mathematically. What is the problem that we want to solve? Uh, we will find also in this block a relation between implied volatilities that we have discussed previously in, this, uh, in uh, the comp computational uh, course of uh, computational finance. And I will link that to also to the concept of building curve. Of course, now the problem is a bit more involved that we had it before for uh, for implied volatilities, because number of instruments that we need to use in order to calibrate the yield curve is significantly higher. So in uh, implied volatilities, we only had one single implied volatility. Now we have uh, possibly tens of different swaps that you would like to use to build a curve. In second block, uh, we will continue, of course. So first we will define optimization routine. Uh, this will be based on the Newton Rapson. Uh, well, I'll explain you how to build up your algorithm. And later, I will also show you how to, this will be in the same block, how to implement that in Python. So this will be very nice, let's say, uh, very, uh, not ent maybe entertaining, but very insightful, how to go from uh, market quotes on swaps, how to use them to build a curve. Uh, here also maybe a little bit maybe um, funny part where I will show you how to build a curve essentially on paper with a simple example of two instruments. I will show you exactly how to build Jacobians that we are also going to heavily rely on and how to uh, get your, let's say, yield curve just simply constructed uh, on slides. Uh, here, my uh, Python experiment. So uh, implementation and also give you um, details on where to uh, where to be careful uh, when you deal with a yield curve in a Python and how what are the possibilities to extend the code um, you'll be given. And then also important part is the uh, impact of different interpolations in the construction of the curve and also impact on hedging. So here we will also discussing uh, if we have different interpolation, how to choose interpolation and what interpolations would make sense in hedging strategies. In this particular experiment, we will be taking a swap, a contract, which is not used for building of a curve, and we'll be checking um, if we are looking at the delta profile of a swap, so given the yield curve, we'll be checking whether the uh, hedging suggestions from sensitivity perspective, whether they make sense, and whether we would like to use those information relying on the uh, interpolations, uh, we would like to use them in practice for the hedging. So this is kind of, I would say, insightful and also tells you a bit more about the impact of the say, locality of the interpolation on the hedging strategies. The final block will be extension of what we have seen in the first two. Here we focused on uh, multi-curves. So it's a new type of uh, uh, curves. So it's not single curve that is used for pricing, but because of since of the financial from the financial crisis in 2008, uh, market has a different view on how to build a curve or that curves would also include information about possibility that a counterparty could default and not pay its obligations. And that will be expressed in the construction of uh, 
multiple. Um, I will also link those uh, multi-curves uh, because in this case, multi-curves was, let's say, market development. Uh, then uh, mathematics came and then we, uh, uh, let's say, in academia, followed the market and see what is the actually mechanism behind that could fit to that uh, observation we see in the market. And here we will explain the market behavior with regards to multi-curves in terms of uh, probabilities of default. And then we will also go through the Python code, how to build your multi-curve uh, simply in Python. And we will end up with a summary and homework. Um, today's homework, or at the end of the third block homework, will be based, will be, the homework will be to perform some implementation and extensions of Python code codes I have provided with additional calibration instruments and also some kind of hedging aspects. I ho hope you will enjoy this lecture. Uh, I think this is one of the most important lecture in this course. And I think it is uh, also, I think it will, it will benefit a lot if you really understand how the yield curve can be constructed, what are the important elements that you have to concentrate on. I hope you enjoy it. In the previous lecture, we have discussed a number of interest rate derivatives that are commonly traded in the interest rate market. Today, we are going to use those instruments that we have learned, and we are going to construct a yield curve. A yield curve is a very important uh, curve that is constructed from the, uh, liquid instruments in the market. And essentially, I would say it's the, one of the most important blocks used in finance in general. Um, so let's go through the, the main key points of the uh, construction of the yield curve. Um, first of all, um, yield curve is used to determine the present value of the future cash flow. So this is a very important element. So uh, if we have a future payments uh, you, with, a using of a, with a usage of a yield curve, we can calculate discount factors. And those discount factors are then used to discount future cash flows. So either, for example, you are um, pricing a derivative, but you can also consider uh, a discounting future cash flows of a certain company that uh, let's say promises to deliver some future value of the uh, of the products they sell and the incomes they expect to have, and of course, depending on the discount factors, the current valuation of a company can significantly vary. And that's this is why the yield curve is so much important in a low interest rate environment. So, if the yield curve, if the yields are very low, then obviously future cash flows of the company, those are uh, essentially growing in value because the discounting effect is smaller and smaller. But if interest rates will be larger, then the future value today will be worth less. So the, there is a significant, actually very important, big impact from yield curve on cash flows and also the present valuations of uh, not only of interest rate swaps, forward rate agreements we have seen, but also about evaluation of the companies traded in the stock market. So it's not only for pricing, but also about the valuations and usage also for pension funds, etc. Um, and moreover, so another step is that if we have a yield curve, we can compute from this curve a forward rates that they can be used to valuation in valuation of derivatives like swaps and derivatives that we have discussed in the previous lecture. So it's a very important building block. Uh, yield curve is typically constructed from very liquid instruments. Um, and the reason for that is that um, liquid instrument essentially means there is more certainty about the value. This means that um, if you have a liquid instrument, for example, you may have a bid ask spread, which is very wide. This means there is additional uncertainty. So if you choose even a value in between, it does not mean that this is a real value that you could express the, uh, the, the curve. So if you have a uh, um, liquid, means the bid ask spread will be very narrow. This means uncertain, uncertainty related to uh, using of that, let's say, whether you could buy or sell at given quote that will be reduced. So liquidity is important. And also, on the other hand, if you have uh, pricing uh, assignments, so if you're pricing a derivative and you would like to perform hedging, obviously you will be targeting, and so you're using your curve, yield curve for pricing. And in a hedging, you'll be also using the most liquid instruments because those typically are the cheapest in the sense that there is the, the, the desk spread is the narrowest. Um, 
From mathematical perspective, um, the main concept of a yield curve, yield curve is to map market quotes of liquid instruments, so again here, to some unified curve. As you can imagine in the market, and also what we have already discussed in the previous lecture, uh, there are plenty, if not a thousand different combinations of different market instruments in the interest rate world. And of course, what is the, what is the connection between all of those instruments? And the connection actually is the yield curve. So if you use uh, liquid instruments, you can construct a curve and you can replace essentially all those instruments using that particular curve. If you see, for example, that you have um, a swap with a counterparty and a swap from a yield curve and from counterparty, uh, the, let's say you have a swap from the yield curve based on yield curve, however, your counterparty wishes to charge um, less or more, then you can see either there is uh, uh, arbitrage, but you can also think of a perspective of uh, uh, risk associated with default probabilities. Because don't forget that if we talk about swaps, we are exchanging flows, we are swapping flows from one counterparty to another one, and that could have also your know, probability whether you default before the payment takes place is also should be included in that. And that's also the concept of uh, multi curves that we are also going to discuss today. And uh, so we have this unified curve. So the curve which connects um, includes all those um, market instruments into one, essentially one function. And this function represents the expectation of the future rates. In the previous lectures, I think it was lecture number three, we were looking at this dynamics of a yield curve. And at that point, you could see that this curve is not a low, it looks stochastic because we observe this curve from day to day. Um, from today's perspective, this curve is very deterministic because market prices based on expectations. Expectation doesn't mean that if we look at the 30-year swap, for example, that this is this exactly what the price would be in 30 years. No, of course not. Tomorrow it will change and so on. So it's a stochasticity involved there. However, from today's perspective, the price that we see, uh, we can trade a derivative, it's actually the expectation. It's also what we have discussed previously in the computational finance course. There's always price is an expectation of the future uh, cash flows, discounted future cash flows. Discounting is also important. Um, for, of course, in the if we talk about the curve and we talk about the function in general, eh, so if you have a function which essentially is mapping time to some uh, real values. Uh, it's a continuous function, so yield curve we can think of a continuous function, but number of instruments that we can see in the market is not um, infinite, right? So we have a finite number of instruments. So yield curve is constructed from a discrete discrete set of instruments, so we denote it by pi, which is mapped uh, to, um, to the set of discrete outputs. So we have, um, let's say, this called the spine points we already have discussed before. And to connect those spine points, we use Interpolation. Um, and as I just indicated, those uh, instruments that we are going to use for pricing or we are going to build the curve, those are the liquid um, instruments. You can actually use all the interest rate um, instruments you wish to include, but you have to make sure that those are, let's say, of similar quality. So if you have a very good liquid swap, but many other instruments were, are very illiquid, you could uh, encounter a risk that the impact of the curve will be, let's say, uh, overwhelmed by the quality of the uh, less uh, relevant instruments. So we always, when you build a curve, it's always um, a very uh, important process how to choose those instruments. And also note that uh, if we uh, have a set of instruments today, it doesn't mean that those set of instruments will be also tomorrow. Market also changes. In time, there are more instruments added or sometimes removed from the curve. And later in this course, in the, uh, by the end of this course, we'll be talking about uh, value at risk, where we actually we need to take into account the fact that number of instruments traded and used to build a curve change in time, or they can be less or more. And I will show you the technique how to remap the curve to a given fixed set of market instruments. But that's going to be discussion more on the risk management side. This will be covered later in this course. OK, um, yield curve is a uh, um, fun. So there's not only yield curve is not only a, a mathematical tool or an expectation tool. It has some very important economical uh, insights. So 
And many economists are looking at the yield curve and trying to understand what is the how the economy performs because it's a really it's a barometer it's an indicator of uh, current market um, position in terms of where the capital is and that can be seen for example if the yields going up or down that tells you whether people are investing in bonds or they are prefer to sell the bonds because you, as you can imagine if there's a large it's a huge demand for uh, bonds that would basically mean that the yields are down. Mm -hmm. So it's always inverse relation between the price of a bond and the yield. So if you have uh, increasing uh, yields, this basically means that uh, um, an issuer, so for example, government, they need to offer larger, higher uh, yield uh, in order to attract investors to buy those bonds. So curve is often, the yield curve is often used as the indication where the money in the market is. Is it in the stocks? Is it bonds? Is it short-term bonds or long-term bonds? And now we will be discussing also um, different shapes of the yield curve. We already had a little bit of introduction to that a few lectures ago. Today we will continue uh, in this uh, area. We'll dive into that and also we will build the curve itself. And um, so for example, um, depending on the shape of a curve, we can see whether the economy performs well or it's not. And for example, uh, and historically, um, inverted yield curve. So if it, there's inversion of the curve, this means that the short-term yield is higher than long-term yield. Uh, historically, within one, one and a half years, uh, there is a, a recession. So there is means that the market flow, the capital is investing from the um, short-term, is moving away from the short-term bonds to long-term bonds. This means the yields for the long-term go down and the short term go up. And that's basically, it's an inversion of a yield curve. So essentially what it also suggests that before the recession takes place, there is already a flow movement in the market between different market instruments. And the recession is basically a result of these flows that took place over many years. So recession is not only one thing which happens overnight. It is a result of a processes that took, take, uh, that took place over many, many years often many, many years. The slope and shape of a curve uh, reflects investors' expectations about the future interest rates. And so you have to be also very careful because it could be a curve, your, let's say, investors' reaction based on a curve shape may also cause that the shape will be more pronounced. So it could be considered as a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you see that the a curve is inverting, you'd be also expecting that, okay, there is a crisis coming, so I should relocate my capital. This basically means the acceleration of the, for example, of the curve inversion. If people see that market is expecting or pricing in a crash or a recession, this means also more people will be preparing for that. And then it means also that there is more uh, probability that this recession will take place because people are preparing uh, more and more people preparing this also means those effects of let's say not investing in the economy uh, they'll be more pronounced because if you expect or you see that the market expects a recession you'll be less willing to invest money in a in a company for example and that could have also indeed impacts on causing the recession because there is not enough financing for example for example in the financial system um, it is also essential to remember that limitations, um, that there are some limitations on the curve. So curve doesn't tell you everything. Um, the reason, of course, for that is that we um, yield curve is not uh, purely market driven. There is also a lot of interventions from the central banks. And also you can see there is also a lot of uh, influence from the foreign banks. So banks outside of the country, for example. So there could be also a lot of investments taking place from outside of the country, but also central banks, because they know that by yield, or looking at the shape of a yield curve, they can somehow stimulate the economy, or at least let's say uh, this, if everyone knows that there is a if yield curve inverts, then there is a recession, of course, central bank can inter, uh, intervene and try to avoid this by selling or buying bonds. And that basically would prevent people of expectations will be the store. So yield curve, it is very important. It is important to build it and make sure that your curve is accurate and is well constructed. Uh, from the economical perspective, it gives you a lot of insight, but it's not 100% a reliable tool in forecasting the future because yield curve represents the expectation. So it doesn't mean that this will be indeed the case if we go, let's say, if we are 30 years later in time. Um, 
Okay, and that will be the, um, the I think the last point, the yield curve reflects interest rate expectations, as I just mentioned, and investors' attitudes to risk and their need for different maturities on bonds. So this is, um, the, like I just mentioned, capital flow from short-term bonds to long-term bonds. Um, this is exactly what we see, and that's it's related to the risk appetite of investors. The relationship between yields with different maturities is called the term structure of interest rates. Um, this is, um, if, we, if you hear about term structure of interest rates, term structure of interest rates, then you always should think of a, a yield curve. So it's a time relation and, inter, and, uh, and interest rates. This is also related, this term of a term structure, uh, to our theta t function that we have seen in the, in the case of the Black-Scholes model. Yeah? And also we had seen it the same for Uli. So term structure is always shows you the, let's say, the dynamics if, of movement of the yield curve in time. Um, Another maybe important thing is that in a, to talk about yield curves, of course, yield curve will um, be dependent on the country and um, each country would also have typically different interest rates because there could be uh, different economies. So yield curve is always represents the, uh, the, the local economy. Uh, of course, in the case of the US, so for example, US Treasury bond is used as the, as the benchmark, but not only for US, but it's also extremely important for the rest of the world. Uh, and this is because of the, the, the US economy is the biggest, one of the biggest in the, in the world. And also the, the dollar is the reserve currency. So the, the curve, US Treasury bond curve, it is the most important indicator of not only of the, let's say, US economy, but also the global economy. And whether if there is a recession, for example, in the US, it will have impact uh, worldwide. So this is import also important to keep in mind. On the other hand, if we talk about the government bonds, like, for example, US Treasury bonds, those are considered to be default free. This, this means that uh, a government cannot default on their obligations. Uh, and the reason for that, why, uh, actually for the most governments, this is the case. There's only one um, important difference. Uh, if a government issues bonds in their local currencies, then they can always, um, they, there is basically, it's default free because government can always fund its bonds. So they, essentially, central banks can always print uh, essentially more money to pay back the, the bond. Uh, in the case where, for example, country has issued bonds and the bonds are issued in different currencies than the local currency, then, then, then the default um, risk is, uh, can be substantial. Because, for example, local currency, the local bank cannot print foreign currency to, um, to pay back for the, for the, for the bond. Um, how to think about it? Why this is the case? Why, why some countries issue bonds in their own currency and some issue uh, in foreign currency? Uh, this is a very simple explanation. So if you have a, a small country uh, which that would like to have funding and they have a local currency and they issue a bond. Of course, if you are a foreign investor, you may not willing uh, to invest in a, in a small country because you have two types of risks. First risk is that um, the currency can devalue. This basically means that uh, if a local currency loses its value, you will lose your, your uh, investment. But also you um, have a currency problem because if the currency will devalue, so this, if the local uh, central bank would issue more currency uh, for the bond, essentially that will have uh, two impacts. will have a ne negative impact on the bond because your bond will be less worth. And also um, there will be impact on the currency. So you have FX risk because the currency will be devaluing. So essentially you'll be losing on both sides. This is why there is the reason for those, let's say, small countries that if they cannot uh, find uh, financing within their own currency, they issue bonds. But the bonds could be, for example, denominated in a foreign currency, for example, in US dollar. And then, indeed, you can, the country is not able to print US dollars to pay their own obligations. In that case, that could be uh, uh, it's a not default free. So this is important to keep in mind. Of course, US is issuing only bonds in dollars, so then it's considered to be default free. The same would hold for um, um, European Union and more central banks that they don't have uh, obligations in foreign currencies. And of course, in the US uh, Treasury bonds, and this is the highest liquidity 
So this is the biggest market in the in the bond market and also in the stock market. So um, in the situation may vary depending on the country. And something to another thing to keep in mind, so there's many things to keep in mind, is a risk premium. So um, if you have a so yield or um, bond issuance is not only on the governmental side. You can have also a company that issues bonds. And um, then we, what we talk about risk premium is the difference. So if you have a bond, governmental bond and bond issued by a company, the difference in yields between the two is considered to be risk premium. Uh, because if the company would, there would be a zero chance of default for a company, then you would expect to have the same yield from a government bond and also company bond. However, if there is, a, of course, everyone is, every company can uh, default, this means that the difference it's essentially expressing what is the chance of a default of a company. Of course, because there is a uh, demand and supply, we can still think of a market expectation of a chance of a default. Uh, now, for example, these days you can see that there is some called junk bonds. So the bonds of uh, companies which are uh, low ranked, so extremely high probability of default, they may also yield, uh, get bond financing, so they can issue bond and sell the bonds to the market at a very low or even negative rate, which is very uh, unexpected. This is not common to see. Okay. Um, now let's have a take a look at the different shapes of a yield curve. So this is a standard normal uh, shape of a curve, and this is also indicates the normal situation in the economy. So we have a we have here. So we have a maturity here. We have a rate yield here. So longer in maturity yield is significantly higher than the short term. Uh, um, uh, short-term maturity. So if you investors, they expect more uh, return if they have a uh, uh, longer investment. So if you give money to the bank for savings account, and then you lock your money for 20 years, you will expect significantly higher yield than if you would just put your money on a savings account for a year or two. So this is, um, a, let's say, a healthy economy. Of course, central banks, if they don't see this kind of shape, they would like to impose it, and they can impose it by basically lowering yields. So if you have a flat curve, say like this, central banks could try to pinpoint this point here lower in order to enforce this kind of behavior of the yield curve. This is another case, so this is inverted. You can see you have prepared three different dates. So we have 2018. So this is, you can say, a normal yield curve, so it's increasing in, in time, the rate is increasing in time. And then we have, uh, uh, two, this is 2019, July, you have an inversion of a curve. And then in August of 2019, it is much more pronounced. And we remember in 2019, in uh, October, we had a repo crisis. So you can see there is a, a inversion took place and then something very bad happened in the economy, uh, at least in the financial market. Uh, so the reason why for the inversion would be, for example, here is that why those long term yields go down. So you see the short term yield essentially stays the same, so roughly around 2%. And here the long term yield goes down. And that basically causing this uh, inversion. So if this point will go down, then essentially everything is triggered. Uh, you can think that people who are um, afraid about the situation in the economy, then they're buying, uh, um, let's say, the putting a lot of money in the long-term uh, cap investment. So they don't want to have a, in a, uh, they expect, let's say, let's say, let's call it a safe haven. So they invest money in the long-term bonds because they expect the inflation also not to be significant. And this is the reason why these yields go down. So if the bond price goes up, the yields go down. And this is what we see here because of the demand is much higher than uh, uh, demand is increasing. So this means that the yields should go down. Um, this is not really a healthy mm -hmm. scenario if you talk about, let's say, uh, banks, because banks typically, they um, give you mortgage. So the mortgage is typically, let's say, 20, 30 years. And the financing of a mortgage takes place at the short term. So essentially means that the, there is a less profit for the bank. So banks are willing, very likely, less likely to give you a mortgage in that scenario. Also, this kind of um, uh, scenario where long-term yield is higher than the short term, it's very damaging for the pensions because you can imagine that you save your money to uh, receive some payment in the future. And of course, 
if the yields will be here lower, this this basically means you you are even negative, right? So then essentially you can save less and less for the future, and that's typically also not beneficial. Of course, in the short term this can happen if this preserves for long time period of time. Then in 20, 30 years, we will may encounter significant problem in the economy. And also for people who retire, there'll be no uh, enough uh, money. Uh, another impact that you can consider is the impact of inflation. So here you can see indeed those yields go down because there is demand. People would like to, let's say, park their money on safe accounts, on the safe haven. Uh, however, if the inflation expectation would increase, then these yields will go immediately opposite direction because if you have a 30-year bond at 2% or 2.5%, percent say, and there is an inflation expectation larger, this means that you effectively have negative, negative real yield, and that essentially destroys your capital. So then you would expect to yield that the, the demand for those bonds will decrease, people will sell more bonds, so yields should be higher to compensate uh, for inflation. And why in this case, one, if there is a crisis, if inflation expectation is lower, and typically that's associated with the whole phenomenon of inflation. Inflation, we always think of a case where uh, growing economy, uh, too much money circulation, too much money in the market, everyone is uh, happy, then people are willing to spend, and that is causing inflation. And for that reason, we always consider grow, booming econo economy and higher inflation rate. If the inflation is low, it's typically, or uh, you have a deflation, that's typically associated with uh, uh, prices um, that people are willing to spend less money. Um, this means also the inflation will be lower and then this economy will slow down. Of course, we could. this is basically what we can read from the yield curve. Uh, however, there could be also uh, uh, a combination where inflation is high and the economy slows down. So this is also uh, a possibility that happened in the past maybe also happens in the future time will show here's a steepening of the curve so this is also another phenomena of a curve so this is a let's say transition between a normal economy good expected normal yield curve and then changing the dimension direction towards flattening of a curve of uh, or inverting even the curve and steepening of the curve like i already mentioned it is um, means that the yield curve those short-term yields will go down, typically, and the long-term will go up. So if we expect the economy that there is a recession is over, investors investors will try to sell long-term bonds because they'll be afraid of being stuck to very low yields. So they will try to sell those bonds as soon as possible because low yield for bonds means price is high, they can sell it, they can make profit, and they will try to put money on the short-term, and then basically yields will go down. Because if you have a short-term uh, bonds, essentially means this is easier accessible, economy is doing better, so you can uh, take this money and also invest in the stock market. This is an example also of a, a steepening of a curve, and that's a case where we look at the constant maturity swap. So it's a constant maturity swap is something that we haven't discussed in this course. It's an extension of a, a swap that we have covered previously. And constant maturity essentially is a contract, small extension about the maturity essentially of the swap, where investor um, wishes to fix duration of the swap. So here's a combination. We have a um, 10 year minus two year. So you can see the difference between 10 year CMS, it's a constant maturity swap, and two year. And that tells you about the, the steepening direction of the curve. So this is taken from, uh, um, uh, from the Fed. And you can see, for example, here it was negative. This means that the two year was higher than 10 year. And then a the gray area, so those areas here, 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 those are indicating a recession. So you can see, for example, here it was that it was very clear that after this spread went negative, recession took place. The same here. Here was negative, nothing happened. And then happened, uh, I think, one and a half years later. The same here, you have 2000 and then dot com. After you could see, actually, in the moment when uh, the, the steepening, let's say this was negative spread, the spread start to be positive and then recession took place. So it's not one to one when uh, the spread is uh, negative that we will see the, the um, recession. It could be that it will take more time to see that. Here's the same. So you see that, for example, it, the spread was here negative, was positive, negative.
and then a few years later, recession over some period of time. And now we are in this area. Let's see what, uh, what this, how the spreads will look like. And this is uh, another example. It's a flattening curve. So this is something what we discussed often. Um, flattening curve is a transition curve from the, uh, let's say, normal curve to the uh, inverted curve or the opposite. And this is also often um, indicator what is the status in the economy. So flattening curve or flat curve um, it's basically means a quite difficult situation for the banking in general and also for the pension funds. And another um, aspect about the curve dynamics and factors that may influence interest rates is called so-called YCC, yield control. So uh, yield curve control, YCC. Um, so like I already mentioned, that uh, yield curve is not solely driven by uh, market forces, supply and demand. There could be also significant role of a central bank because central bank, it's uh, controlling uh, most of the central banks, they have um, two targets. It's the employment and also target of inflation. So if there is an inflation which is increasing, uh, central banks can uh, stimulate this inflation or decrease the inflation by increasing the rates. By increasing the rates, they reduce the money supply in the market. This means that people who are, the, let's say, the money circulation or the velocity of money is decreasing because people, instead of investing in uh, um, or consuming, they see actually there is a quite high interest rate, for example, that can stop them from consumption. On the other hand, if, the, um, if the, there is a recession, there is a problem in the economy, by decreasing the rate that can stimulate consumers and also companies to give more money and that hopefully will uh, help the economy to recover. So, so this is um, the point here. So uh, central banks steer the economy by raising and lowering rates. In general, it's, uh, it's easier to decrease rates because that's always positive for the economy. However, um, decreasing and keeping rates too long for too, uh, too low for too long, it is a little bit addictive because uh, companies that they were not able to find financing at the higher rates, uh, it can happen that they are only able to exist because of the very positive financial conditions. And that means that if one day inflation increasing uh, and interest rates will need to be high to compensate, to slow down the inflation, those companies will be in a trouble and likely will not be able to find financing. So it is also very risky, uh, risky game in general on playing uh, on decreasing or keeping the uh, rates close to zero or even negative in the long term. And then we have a yield control. So central banks can actually step in the market, not only control the, let's say, short term uh, issuance of bonds, um, they can also buy or sell bonds on different maturities. In that way, they can enforce uh, certain demand, the yields that they like to see, that they will uh, stimulate the economy. Of course, um, stimulating of the economy does not mean that uh, it's healthy economy, right? So if you have, let's say, a good example, a thermometer, if you change just the term temperature in the thermometer, it does not mean that the patient that you measure the temper that measures the temperature, it's healthy. Right? So this is also something to keep in mind. If a central bank is active in a bond market, buys or sells bonds, uh, it will be shown also on the money supply and also on the balance sheet of the central bank. So this is also something to keep in mind. And uh, effectiveness of the central banks, so whether how, how much of those bonds they can buy or sell, it's also um, um, affected or it's also could be very much limited by increasing inflationary pressures. So if there is no pre uh, inflationary pressure that's always tempting, very attractive to decrease the rates to stimulate the economy. However, if the inflation shows up and the economy is not fully recovered, then uh, banks may be forced to increase rates this means we also need to slow down even economy further in order to avoid the problem with uh, too much inflation. Let's now define yield curve mathematically. Um, I have already mentioned before that yield curve essentially consists of uh, spine points. This means we have uh, uh, times t, right? so it's a set of uh, different spine points. And we have corresponding discount factors. So T1, DFT1, T2, DFT2, and so on. 
And then those discount factors essentially are defined like we had before. So it's an expectation. We have a one, zero, uh, one value of a zero coupon bond at the maturity and then properly discounted. Um, since discount factors contrary to the short rate, so here we have a short rate, but those discount factors are expectations of those short rates, then um, we can simply express this zero coupon bond or those spine points in the following form. We have a DFTI and then we have this uh, E minus R I T A. So this is an element that we, we talk about those zero coupon bonds, which we will essentially we will find those zero coupon bonds such that if we have uh, spine points and we introduce interpolation, then it will be able to price back all the market instruments. So this is we have basically a function that we are uh, and allows us for mapping of those pairs with some interpolation to the set of real numbers. In the past, we had those real numbers to be positive because yield in the past uh, were always, almost always positive. Of course, now we also allow for negative uh, interest rates. This means that this R uh, is just R and we don't have any more R plus. So it's not a constraint anymore. Now it's essentially from a calibration perspective, you can consider it to be easier. Um, so again, uh, spine points, those are important points which coming from a market. Later, we will discuss exactly how those spine points are related to swaps and other financial instruments that will come in in few slides. And then we also have a, um, like interpolation routine, which is in between. Um, how to, we will calibrate this, essentially calibration of those uh, zero coupon bonds. It will be very much alike what we have done previously. Uh, once we talked about uh, implied volatility. This was discussed in the course of uh, computational finance. So maybe you want to refresh what exactly what was happening there. In a few slides, I will also give you a little bit of flavor of how this um, connection um, is present. Okay, a um, few things that you already discussed. So before we uh, construct the curve, we, before we, let's say, find out the curve, we also need to establish some criteria um, where we can say, um, this is good curve or this is bad curve. What are the requirements that our yield curve will need to uh, satisfy? Um, yes, so a combination of a spine points and the interpolation scheme used to construct the yield curve is crucial, not only for pricing, but also for hedging. So this is we, when we talk about the requirements, we have to focus not only on the pricing because pricing comes naturally once we calibrate the yield curve. This means we are pricing to par, we will find out the curve such that we can recover market instruments, liquid instruments that were used for building up the curve. But we also have some other cases. We also need to think of hedging because if you have a, a yield curve and you like to check sensitivity of your product that you price with yield curve uh, to all the market instruments on the curve, um, that is also important requirement that your hedging will be good. So for example, if you have a case where you have one year swap, but in order to hedge that with a 50 year swap, that's not maybe the best idea. Maybe something is not re really well configured in your curve. Later, I will show you experiments where we'll be basically uh, playing with different interpolation routines. And those impact will be uh, seen. It will be very clear to you that interpolation and uh, in different settings on the curve are very important. Okay, so a few points that we have to keep in mind. Yield curve should be put to price back the instruments. Okay, this is the first requirement. This is necessary um, to actually get a curve. Okay, forward uh, rates should be continuous. Okay, so if we have a continuous yield curve, essentially if it construct forward rates, those rates should be also um, continuous. It's fine. Interpolation used to construct the curve should be as local as possible. So a small change in the node of a curve should not affect the values which are far away. Okay, this is related to this hedging argument we just discussed. Uh, this means that if you would have, a, uh, let's say, if you um, check the sensitivity of your product to, let's say, one month, uh, some cash instrument, then you should not see sensitivity, the impact on the far end of the curve. And the hedge should be local too. So this is the sensitivities. So those two things. So if you're local, um, the interpolation should be local and also um, for the pricing and also the, the hedge. So, and also this basically means we need to have a curve which is continuous, essentially it's differentiable. And also we have uh, bricks which are as local as possible. It's the, basically the, the main requirements for building of a curve. 
From mathematical perspective, again, so now we have to define some optimization problem before we solve, we find the solution for the curve, we, before we build the curve, we have to define some elements that we are going to optimize. So what we are going to do, we are defining first a vector of zero coupon bonds. So those are the spine points, simply defined as a different maturities, different times t1 until time tn. And we also have qi. This means that here is a vector of a different, uh, actually, so it's a, actually not maybe a vector, so it's a PVI, so it's a value, present value of a contract, which depends possibly in a whole vector of a spine points. So if you have a swap, your swap will not only depend on uh, one point, but actually will depend on all, many of the, possibly even all, uh, zero bond points or spine points that are constructed. So in general, sometimes we can write, uh, we have a whole vector uh, df as the as the function which argument for pricing of our swap and also we have a qi which is quote in the market for this instrument so essentially we are and of course this will be for uh, many market instruments not only i but it will be from let's say for on to n or even more which in this case will be only n i will show you later why this is exactly n but uh, here you see that uh, we basically need to uh, for every instrument we use to build curve, this condition needs to be satisfied. So the quote in the market and the quote and the price from the curve should be the same. That's the requirement which also satisfies that we are pricing back all the instruments we have. And of course, this is a vector. This is also a vector because this will correspond to the number of instruments we have used to build a curve. This is number of uh, instruments we price using the curve. It's a function of vector of discount factors, of spine points. So this is, these are basically, it's also a vector. So um, to find out this uh, difference, so we have to choose some norm in order to optimize. So we optimize on this uh, L norm uh, of this uh, difference of this, uh, um, yes, yeah, so, so it's a PV. Yeah. So the difference between the market and the model. So this is market and this is model price given yield. Before we optimize and find this uh, n-dimensional solution, actually depending on the number of spine points, solution for a yield curve, um, let's take a look how we have done it for a single dimension case where we were looking for implied volatility for the Black-Scholes case. So in the Black-Scholes world, in the course of computational finance, actually, we had a problem where we had a price of the market of an option. And we would like to recover what is the implied volatility, implied Black-Scholes volatility. So the problem was very much alike. So we have a market uh, price. So this is sorry, this is market price of a call option. This is Black Scholes price for given parameter sigma imp, and the difference has to be zero. So we are searching for this parameter sigma implied such that the difference of the two is zero. You can see that this actually very much relates to what we see here. We have a model price of a vector of zero coupon bonds of spine points minus vector of market quotes for those instruments and we are looking for this uh, vector of zero of uh, uh, spine points such that of course with given interpretation such that the difference is still zero this is some to know because this is the, the mathematical way how we want to optimize it yeah so we define some norm on the whole vector so you see it's very very much alike and there are, there are many possibilities how to solve this problem. And then, for example, newton rapson algorithm, there's a Brent algorithm. You can find details also in the book on that. Um, the classical way, and also we are going to follow this way in this course, we are going via newton rapson Of course, in a single case, so um, we have done it in this course of computational finance. You can just uh, refresh maybe how this iteration was built. But essentially, what happened there, how we did, how we arrived at this sigma implied volatility, was uh, we had iteration process where we started with some initial guess for sigma implied, so implied ball, and we used uh, iteration routine to um, that converged essentially to the solution uh, of the, the the problem we want to solve. So our solution is that we want to minimize essentially uh, the absolute different so essentially we are looking at this because if it will be just uh, uh, we want to minimize the difference the solution could be also negative if you want to minimize we like to minimize and then we have a certain norm Here, for example we can do as i just defined for a yield curve we could say we have some norm here 
And in Newton Rapson case, we have a, a iteration for sigma n plus one is equal to sigma n, and then we evaluate Black Scholes models, Black Scholes model for sigma n, which is just here, the previous value for sigma imp. We have a minus market value of a pole option for this particular strike. And then we divide it by Vega. We divide by sensitivity of a Black Scholes of the model price to the sigma n that we have just used in the previous. And this is the iteration process we have to uh, perform in order to um, to find this optimal sigma n, sigma n plus one or sigma n. The stopping criteria in this case would be that if we have a difference between sigma n plus one minus sigma n is sufficiently small. So if the model is already by any iteration, we are not improving so much. That could be one criterion. Uh, also requirement is that this difference between the, the norm of um, difference of a Black Scholes model and market price should be close to zero. Otherwise, if you have, for example, model that's converging, but it's maybe not converging to the value we would like to see. So always this criterion that this difference should be zero, it's it's requirement. Uh, of course, one can claim why this um, why it is not ensured this is converging, because this actually function sigma Black Scholes sigma imp, it is monotone in uh, um, in the sigma. Right? So Black Scholes price, we know that price of an option is a function of a sigma, it's monotone. So this means that if uncertainty increases, option price will also increase. If uncertainty decreases, option price will decrease. That's just uh, um, the, the, otherwise it will be arbitrary. So this is a fact. However, in from numerical perspective, if we have an area where the, in, the change in sigma, so if there is a solution of our space, it's a, so the solution is very flat in sigma. So this means that um, by changing sigma, even big difference in sigma, maybe there is no really big impact on the pricing. So this means that this derivative would be very uh, in um, very small in, would have a very small gradient. So we have a small gradient. This means that the search algorithm will have very difficult time to find. Uh, um, the solution, the optimal solution. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind. Always look at the iteration differences between these two points. So if there are no uh, significant differences between next iteration step and the, the difference between the market and the model is sufficiently small, that's a good solution. Otherwise, you may try, need to try with a different initial guess. It could be also a solution. Of course, in our case, we need to extend this framework from a uh, uh, single uh, problem. So because here we only look for one sigma n, now we're looking for a whole vector of uh, sigma n's, we can say, whole vector of implied volatilities at once. And of course, in our case, if we have, for example, um, Black Scholes, and we would calibrate many prices for Black Scholes, those are rather independent, yeah? because for each of them, uh, th there will be no dependence between uh, different implied volatilities. However, in our case, we know that every spine point will impact very likely other uh, instruments that we use. Because there is a, in a swap, we have this case, for example. So if you have payments, so for example, if you have a, a one payment here, second payment here, and third payment here, that could be one swap. But we could also have a swap that will pay here over this period, over this period, over this period, over this period. So we see that even if uh, uh, that those first few points, they're intersecting. So this means there is an intersection between these two instruments. So if we change those first few spine points, for example, here and here, this will also impact not only this short instrument, this, uh, let's say, three-year or so instrument, but also the long one. So there's a lot of interaction, a lot of intersection of the, post, the, the, the parameters will impact uh, the spine points, all the instruments on the curve. So this is important to keep that in mind. So it's not as separable separatable as is here. So that's that's important takeaway. In the next slide, we will go to the further into details how how to build this interpolation, how to build this optimization. And in this case, we'll be talking about the building of a Jacobian that has to be used to find the solution for the optimization that we are going also to build in a in a few slides from now. In the case of Black Scholes, of course, we um, we calculate implied volatilities not only for a given strike. So, for example, here we have strike one, but we have to repeat this experiment. We have to repeat the optimization for multiple strikes. So for example, here would be one, two, and so on. So, as you can see in the 
the construction of a, a implied volatility smile or skew or this is hockey stick, uh, we could also have a very similar case as we have for yield curve. So we have number of spine points, let's say, implied volatility values. And then if you would like to price an option in between, so if we have uh, two strikes here for which we have market quotes, we also need to perform some kind of uh, interpolation between those points. Um, luckily, this interpolation in the case of a yield curve, uh, we know how to handle it easily because, for example, we have these conditions about uh, continuity and also differentiability. We also have a perspective of hedging how to look at those, um, those conditions. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of a Black-Scholes case, or let's say implied volatility smile or skew, this interpolation is much more problematic. Uh, this will not be discussed in this course, in the follow-up course. I will show you that if you choose interpolation of volatilities in the, um, in the equity world and you choose this interpolation between different strikes uh, incorrectly or you do, don't do it uh, smartly enough, you may generate a lot of arbitrage in the pricing. This essentially means that interpolation in uh, implied volatility smile or skew, it is, I would say, even maybe more important that you have for yield, for yield curve. We can really uh, see it which of the interpolation choices is the preferred one. In the implied volatile smile, you cannot really see it directly. You have to do something first. You have to calculate so-called implied density uh, from the implied volatile smile. Then actually, then you can see the possibility of possibilities of arbitrage. That will be clear. We will discuss it in depth in the following up course, but this at least to give you a flavor that interpolation it is very, very important in general. So we have to put a lot of attention on choosing appropriate interpolation routine. Uh, for yield curves, It is uh, we have uh, some criteria how to choose those interpolations uh, in the implied volatilities. It's maybe even more problematic.